the real odds of snow at Christmas. 2020 was technically a white Christmas, with 6% of weather stations recording snow falling, although only 4% reported lying snow. And the end of an era for space observations. It weighed in at 4,000 kilograms. It was the size of a very large car, a small minibus. It's Thursday the 23rd of December and you're listening to Weathersnap from the Met Office. Hello, I'm Claire Nazir and this is Weathersnap, an insider's guide to the week's weather headlines. Met Top A, Europe's first polar orbiting meteorological satellite, was taken out of service on the 30th of November. The pioneering craft has provided observations data for the Met Office and forecasters around the world for 15 years. To learn more about Met Top A's contribution to modern meteorology, I spoke to Tom Blackmore, manager of the Space Data Products and Systems team here at the Met Office. Metope was a polar orbiting satellite, which means it is sitting at an altitude of about 800 kilometres above the Earth's surface. It circles the Earth about 14 times every day, uh, taking measurements of the Earth's atmosphere. So the information, obviously, we absorb every day here at the Met Office. And the launch itself comes with a bit of a story, doesn't it? These satellites are launched by basically strapping them to the top of an enormous rocket, uh, which launches them into space. So, uh, yes, there were six attempts to launch this one. When they put the satellite on top of the rocket, they then fuel the rocket ready for launch, and they've only got a certain number of hours. It's around 50 hours to make a launch attempt before they have to take the fuel out of the rocket again. In this case, due to weather and technical issues, the, the, in the first three-day window, it wasn't launched, so they had to reschedule. Uh, the third day came along, and um, again, the weather wasn't very good. Uh, it was touch and go whether the launch would go ahead, but it was just about okay, despite lightning flashes going off in the background uh, as it was launched. So it made it into space on the sixth attempt up into near-Earth orbit. I presume this is the sort of issue that we have nowadays as well. Nothing has really changed. But what has changed is that the resolution of these remote sensing tools are really important, obviously, for weather. How many satellites would you say approximately are up in near space right now? Over 200 of these currently operational. Um, we only use a very small number of these. A lot of them are very specific, taking very specific measurements or uh, research satellites. So in terms of satellites that are useful for operational meteorology with looking at around um, 20 satellites. And that's looking at not only storms and cloud and rain, uh, but also sea surface temperature, I presume, and it can pick up all of that information as well, depending on what wavelength it's it's attuned to. Is that correct? Primary purpose of METOPE was to provide atmospheric measurements, profiles of temperature and humidity for NWP models. But um, with that huge suite of instruments, there were many other measurements that could be taken. So we could uh, monitor oceans and ice. You can infer uh, surface winds from measurements from that satellite, um, atmospheric chemistry measurements, ozone amounts and so on. How big is this satellite, this METOPE? How big was it? It weighed in at roughly um, 4,000 kilograms, and it was the size of a very large car, a small minibus, uh, if you can imagine that. How is it decommissioned and brought down from space? The satellite itself has some thrusters uh, on it, which are used once the satellite ends its operational lifetime to reduce the orbit. So it's sitting at around 817 kilometres in orbit. It's reduced down to about 580 kilometres. And while they're doing this, they're performing some extra experiments and so on to provide information for future satellite instruments uh, to help improve those. And when it's in this orbit at 580 kilometres above the Earth's surface, it will then over the next 25 years gradually get pulled into the Earth's atmosphere where it will burn up. That will mean that there's um, no risk of it leaving any space junk in space that could potentially destroy other satellites. What replaced or what is replacing Met Top A? There are two other satellites which are pretty much carbon copies of METOP A, named METOP B and C rather unoriginally, which are in space at the moment, still providing huge benefit to our weather forecasting. And the next generation of these satellites is in the very advanced planning stages. They're due to be launched in 2024, the first of these weather satellites. So that's exciting things to come. That's so interesting. And thank you very much, Tom Blackmore. Well, down here on the ground, many will be anxiously searching the skies for the slightest indication of that hallowed phenomenon, 
snow at Christmas. For weeks now, as every year it seems, TV newspapers, bookmakers and online chat rooms have worked themselves into a frenzy speculating about the odds of a white Christmas. But how realistic is a white Christmas? Here's Helen Roberts and, spoiler alert, it's not quite as high as some might hope. The question of snow at Christmas begins well before December. And as a meteorologist, it's not unusual to receive inquiries before we've even reached the end of summertime. In reality, the UK is more likely to experience snow between January and March than December, with snow or sleet falling an average 3.9 days in December, compared with 5.6 days in February. White Christmases were more frequent during the 18th and 19th centuries. It was then that London held the famous frost fairs, where people gathered on the frozen Thames to play games and generally make merry. It was memories of these events that inspired writers such as Charles Dickens to foster the image of snowy white Christmases, most famously in his novel A Christmas Carol. Temperatures across the UK have warmed since those pre-industrial times. Despite that, in the years since the 1960s, around half have seen at least 5% of weather stations record snow in some form on Christmas Day. In theory, that means we could still expect at least half of all Christmas days to have snow. Joyful news for so-called snowmantics. But let's take a look at how a white Christmas is defined. The official criteria is for one snowflake to be observed falling in the 24 hours of the 25th of December, somewhere in the UK. That's just one snowflake, so probably not worth rushing to dust off that sledge. Historically, the Met Office used a single location to record those flakes, and that was a Met Office building in London. However, the practice of placing bets on a white Christmas led to an increase in locations, which now include Belfast, Aberdeen and Cardiff. Data from official observation sites throughout the UK is now also analysed in order to provide a clearer picture of where snow is present. The good news, at least for snow lovers, is that this new definition means 38 of the last 54 Christmases have been judged to be white. However, the Dickens image of snow lying deep, crisp and even is a little rarer. Widespread lying snow that's where more than 40% of observation stations reported snow at 9am on the 25th, has only happened four times since 1960. That's 1981, 1995, 2009 and 2010. The last being unusual in having ground cover at 83% of all stations. 2020 was also technically a white Christmas, with 6% of weather stations recording snow falling, although only 4% reported lying snow. The position of the UK means our weather is heavily influenced by the North Atlantic. That generally means mild and wet winters. But all it takes is a swing in wind direction, a shift to continental or Arctic air, and those soggy conditions might, just might, transform into the magical flakes beloved by young and old alike. Well, with the details of how Christmas 2021 is looking weather-wise, here's Ada McGiven with the outlook for the next few days. If you are longing for a white Christmas this year, well, all is not lost entirely. There will be some white stuff, but mainly you'd have to be over higher ground and across northern parts of the UK. In fact, Christmas Eve starts off fairly wintry in northern Scotland with the risk of disruptive snow above three or 400 metres. Watch out for that if you're travelling on some of the higher routes during Christmas Eve morning. Elsewhere, a lot of cloud cover to begin things on Christmas Eve, fairly damp, over northern England, southern Scotland, northern Ireland, with a lot of hill fog here and some low-level fog through the Midlands and into parts of Wales. Later in the day, a band of heavy rain and strong winds pushes into southwest England, Wales and then Northern Ireland, before eventually pushing northeastwards and stalling for Christmas Day itself across Northern Ireland, Southern Scotland, Northern England. And that sets up a three-way split for Christmas Day. It's going to be cold but bright across much of Scotland and after a frosty start there'll be some sunshine here. 
Further south, across Northern Ireland, much of Northern England, into North Wales, parts of the Midlands and East Anglia, generally grey skies, some hill fog and some outbreaks of mostly light rain. The possibility is that mixes with the colder air further north that we'll see some flakes of snow, but mainly these will occur, I think, over the tops of the Pennines. Further south again, and it's much milder, Wales, southwest England, seeing spells of rain and showers and some heavy downpours at times as well. Those rain or showers push north and again for Boxing Day, they'll stall through central parts of the country. So similar conditions yet again. And for Boxing Day itself, we're going to see cold but bright weather continue in the far north of Scotland. Fairly showery in the south of England and South Wales with mild air here. And in between, a lot of cloud, outbreaks of rain and again the possibility of some flakes of snow mainly over the hills. A lot of cloud cover on Bank Holiday Monday and rain or showers in many places with the possibility again of some snow over the hills in the north. Thanks, Aidan. Before we go, Martin Bowles has last week's highs and lows. Here are the UK weather extremes for the week beginning 13th of December. The highest and lowest temperature were both measured on the same day, Sunday the 19th. Whitechurch in Dyfed, southwest Wales, reached 15.1 Celsius in the afternoon, and Braemar in Aberdeenshire, northeast Scotland, dropped to minus 9.1 Celsius in the early hours of the morning. The largest daily rainfall for the week was 37.2 mm at Kinlochhue in Ross and Cromarty, Scotland, on Tuesday. On a day when much of England, Northern Ireland and Scotland were covered in thick cloud, Wales saw the best of the sunshine. On Saturday, 7.2 hours were measured at Aberdaran on the western tip of the Thin Peninsula. Thanks, Martin. Well, that's it for Weathersnap. On behalf of the podcast team here at the Met Office, we'd like to wish you all a very happy Christmas. I hope you can join us again when Weathersnap returns in the new year. But for now, I'm Claire Nazir. Editor is Adrian Holloway. And thanks for listening. Weathersnap is a podcast by the UK Met Office. For the latest weather conditions where you are, download the Met Office weather app.